when I was at ACE the first time and, and then Rick, Pastor Rick went down a little bit later, I could hardly wait for him to go through the torture they put me through. So I went down with him and then I had a car so he could go to school. And, uh, but they, like everybody else, had changed so much. They never did put him through the torture. But when I went down, the torture was because they were trying to teach you how to teach kids. And so they would explain to pastors who are inevitably late. If you've noticed in this church, I ask our singers to start immediately. And the odd time everybody get busy, I'll just start, stand up and start talking. And the reason is it's the principle, not the time. And it's, it's setting yourself to say, do what you say and say what you do. And people don't realize in many other areas of their life, people get used to saying something and not doing it. It actually kills your prayer life because you don't believe yourself. And it's when you don't believe yourself, then you get used to saying, and you run into people all the time. So they would explain to pastors, and they would explain how many dollars in taxi money it's going to cost to go from their hotel out to where the school is. And um, they would say, we're going to, the bus will be leaving at 7 o'clock. And they said, when we... If you wonder what seven o'clock means, they meant it meant when it was six fifty nine at thirty seconds, the leader, the bus driver, will begin to pull his foot off the clutch, or yeah, and well, in that case, clutch, but okay, but um, and then when he lifts it off the clutch, the, the bus will begin to move exactly at seven. And he said, one day a lady came running to the bus. Hold it, hold it. Pastor, will just be one minute. And he said, do you know what we do in those situations? In those situations, we know who we left behind. <laughs> because see, what he was trying to teach people is that we can be five minutes late, 10 minutes late. We live our own life. And see, we're living in this Canada where everybody thinks they can do whatever they want. And you can as long as we're in the system. But see, the main person you want to believe, whether you be for God or after God, I don't know, but is you. After God, you're the number one person you want to believe because you do not want to con yourself. Most people, a lot of people, you don't maybe know it, are actually conning themselves. And, and if you're conning yourself, how are you ever going to win? And that's what we, of course, been teaching on. But that's one of the illustrations that we operated. And, but see, he was trying to break pastors, and then he put you in an office like the kids would be in. And they would give you demerits like all the kids would get. Now, see, this was on my time. Then I had to go through a lot of issues when Pastor Rick went down there because they'd softened so many of their rules. They weren't making them come right on time and they weren't giving them because at the end of the day, they didn't tell you what was going to happen. At the end of the day, they would read how many demerits or detentions somebody had in one pastor. I think, because I'm a bit of a suck when I don't want to get in trouble, I can behave myself. And I don't think I got any, but the lead pa one pastor that was there, he had 23 hours worth of detentions. <laughs> now, what they didn't tell you was, because there's a lot of things they didn't tell you, was they didn't tell you that on the first day, they say, we're giving grace to everybody. But at the morning, because see, everything they had taught you was we do what we say. When you leave the class, these are pastors. These are pastors that pastored various sized churches. These were 60 year old pastors sitting in a little office, told not to talk. At lunchtime, you walk through the office. If you're talking to somebody, then you get a demerit. See? And what they were trying to do was see, we get used to ruling. And what you also want to make sure is you are used to serving. And a, and a servant is, is the power. So they would teach them that, and they would give you demerits if you went through. And then they told all the pastors, because pastors have different theological issues, and they told them that they could discuss all their differences, but not during the week, because they were there for school. And so they said, come Saturday morning, we've set a special time aside, two hours, where Saturday morning you can all come and the Pentecostals can disagree with the Baptists and, the, and all that. But they knew that we were all released by noon on Friday and we all had our flights booked 
on Friday. So that's why they left the discussion period until Saturday. And what they were doing was setting a mentality. We're not here to disagree. We're here to learn how to be a student. And then they would put you in your pace and you do your pace and you, because they wanted you to feel what the kids feel not from the learning alone, because you were learning. I'll remember if you did that, you remember monkey business and, and then the first f- pace four and five or five and six, whichever it was that's the one that teaches all the workings of the learning center. Because see, they wanted you to understand what that student was going through, but they mainly wanted you to learn to keep your word. And that's where I love not maybe all the Baptists, but a lot of the Baptists that I knew were very dedicated to keeping their word. And that's part of the reason why when you say you're going to do something, you do it. When you say you're going to come somewhere, you come there. And because you have to convince yourself that you believe what you're saying. So if you say, I'll see you at seven o'clock and you don't come till 10 after seven, you don't believe you. Why? Because if you'll find that you'll encourage yourself more if you pray out loud, uh, especially in the Holy Ghost. Now, you can't do that when you're in a crowd. You pray, pray quietly. But stir up yourself in your most holy faith. I guess I didn't clip this on the back of my neck, right? And um, in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Because we want to stir ourselves up. And isn't that interesting? You stir the Holy Ghost up. You don't stir them up in the world you stir him up in you. And many born-again Christians have let him go dormant. Now, he's still moving around them, but inside of them, he's gone dormant. And then that's what we call people returning to the Lord. We call them backslidden. When they come back, you'll find the Holy Ghost will take them right back to where they were. Thank God we don't have to go back to square one. God, Holy Spirit, whatever he's developed in you, you own it forever, but then you can ignore it and, and pass it. So we, the principle is we walk around praying the Holy Ghost, stir ourselves up because we want the Holy Ghost to talk to us. That's the whole point. And then, and then what we do is um, we come in agreement because we stirred ourselves up and now see, we don't have to have all the faith and you will never have all the faith for everything you need. The truth is when you develop yourself in the Lord, you will have most of the time, you will not need other people to agree with you. Most of the time, because you'll already know what you believe, know what the scripture says. You'll speak to that mountain, okay? However, every one of us will have seasons where it's a little bit more challenging. It's maybe close and personal, and we need someone just to stand with us who's not in the emotion of the moment. And so that's not a weakness. That's the Bible, okay? Because there's this guy that he was a pretty well-known evangelist and pretty well-known minister. And one day he was walking by his friends and he said, hey guys, will you pray with me? Because I'm about to go to the cross. So Jesus wanted people to pray with him. And if anybody could do most of the praying on his own, hello? Hello? So even Jesus, because he was under a place of great stress and pressure, he wanted his friends to pray with him. Isn't that amazing? Because he was man then. He was God in man, but he was operating as man, human being, right? God's been talking to you already. It's just that we've been too busy to hear him. And as we're beginning, I've quoted this many times and Sometimes I quote it to Pastor Billy, and I hope he'll quote it to me. Catherine Kuhlman used to pray a prayer, slow me down, Lord, slow me down. Slow me down, Lord, slow me down. Because she knew she could move faster with God when you're slow and you hear what God is saying than running away and, and doing your, your own thing. So slow me down. At the same time, Catherine Coleman would overwork herself so much that they would sometimes have to, she'd have to go to a sanatorium where they would put her to sleep and give her um, intravenous. So that's why she had to pray, slow me down, Lord, because her personality was to work and work and work and work and work and work and work. And when she died, they said there was tapes and tapes and tapes of teachings and 
things she wanted to express that were just locked, that she'd kept preaching and putting away and preaching and putting away. Why? Because you're, you're a human being and we're struggling. So we're learning how to walk in the spirit, but we're also learning how to walk in the flesh and, uh, and to balance those two things. If you do one or the other too much, you might get out of balance. So we're calling this the month to listen. We're asking God for a prayer pandemic because we're praying for the whole month, especially focusing on the 20th to 28th, 18th to 28th, sorry. And a prayer pandemic means what if Christians actually got excited about praying and excited about seeking the Lord and excited? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be a really good pandemic to, to pray into being? Um, and so, um, and again, we're, re- we're reviewing a little bit. Why don't people pray more? I'll tell you, because they think they get no results. They won't say it. It seems very unchristian to say that. They think it's a waste of time. And they can't see results. See, that's the other problem. Sometimes you're getting results, but because you can't see it, you give up because you can't see it. And a lot of things, if if you're... You've been around for a while. You realize God was doing a whole lot of things that you couldn't see, and then all of a sudden it popped up. Um, so uh, what we want to do here, I, have, I just want to read my writing here. Um, so there's a lot of things, again, we're never going to understand, but God puts them in there for us to ponder. So some of the scriptures, for example, he says, uh, pray without ceasing. That's a good one. That's a little confusing for all of us. So as theologians, we say this, which I think is totally accurate, be in fellowship all the time. Because it's very hard to pray in tongues while you're sleeping. And besides, here's what it says at the same time when it says pray without ceasing. It also said rejoice always. So you're supposed to rejoice always while you're praying without ceasing. Mathematically, that almost seems impossible. Oh, and by the way, it says give thanks at the same time as you're praying without ceasing and rejoicing. Always give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. So his will is that you pray without ceasing, praise him all the time, worship him all the time, thank him for everything. This is his will. So I I think we all are going to need the help of the Holy Spirit because I don't know how you think you can accomplish that except... If God tells us to do something, there must be a way to do it. So we, in our brain, we say that's impossible. It's only impossible in our brain because in our spirit, it's not impossible because God does a lot of things at the same time in his spirit. So our questions that we dealt with and we're reviewing is could it be that prayer is not to move God, but to do, sorry, could it be that prayer is not to move God to do what I want God to do but could prayer be to move me to do what God wants? So am I part of God's answer or am I trying to make God work for me to perform what I want? And of course, we we went into that a bit more. Second question, is God to work for me, my desires, or am I to work for God his desires. These are the questions we're looking at through Scripture. Another question is, though words are important, could our heart, could our heart be the most valuable tool in prayer? The words are important. So I'm not minimizing God's word, not minimizing your words. What I am doing is saying, could something more important than words be could our heart be the most valuable tool in prayer, matter of fact, in all our actions? Um, I, you, we could be God's instrument to change things that he desires. I could be, you could be. Imagine God thinks you can change the world. He's never thought anything else. When he birthed you, he never thought you could do anything less than him. That's how he thinks. Our problem is we keep telling him he's wrong. So that's why we're teaching on prayer because I've got to get over here where I tell God he's right. Right? It's like in the Christian circles, it's like Christians have anorexia. 
So one of the most powerful commercials I ever remember is a very thin girl looking at herself in the mirror, seeing a very large girl. And she kept saying, I've got to lose weight. But see, we saw her as she was. She saw herself from a different angle. And therefore, we'd be saying, no, you need to eat. And she's saying she needs to reduce weight. And that's what Christians have done. They see themselves as weak. God sees you as strong. They see themselves with little authority. Oh, please, God, please, God, please, God, please, God, please, God, please, God, beg you, beg you, beg you. He's yourself. All authority is given unto you with some caveats, okay? And um, and, uh, so I could, you could be God's instrument to change uh, things he desires. Then our key verse that we looked at was Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Um, and that's in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And it's also in the middle of one of the greatest prayer chapters uh, that are in the Bible. In, it's in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount and in the middle of a great prayer chapter. Um, and uh, so in Luke, before the Lord gives them the Lord's Prayer, which is better referred to as the Disciples' Prayer, and if you're in this church, you've heard me say the same thing for years, so why stop now saying the same thing? We as Christians do with the disciples' prayer or the Lord's prayer the very thing in those same chapters he asked us not to do. So we, because we refuse to read the whole chapter, the whole three verses, the whole Sermon on the Mount, we just took something that was a little few verses and we quote it back to God. He didn't ask you to quote it back to him. He asked you to do it. How do we know that? Because in Luke, it tells us, then this is how you should pray. Sorry, that's in Matthew. Jesus says, then this is how. He didn't say this is what you should pray. Jesus never once, you never heard Jesus in all his prayers saying, our Father, which art in heaven, now will be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm not mocking the prayer. I'm mocking the Christians. And I got Bible to go by. Now, I can say this because I'm in this church talking to this group of people who came to hear my thoughts. You don't have to agree with my thoughts. I'm just saying you should go back to that chapter and say, isn't it ridiculous how the whole church... Now, I love that prayer. I don't mind quoting that prayer. I can quote that prayer like I quote any scripture. But he didn't give me scripture to quote. He gave me scripture to do. Right? And matter of fact, over there in Luke, they said to us, teach us how to pray. And so he teaches them how to pray, and us Christians come along and say, oh, this is the lessons on praying, and then we don't use the lessons that are in there. Now, we're not going into that scripture this morning because we're basically trying to stay with uh, Matthew chapter 6 for 33. Um, Whatever his disciples saw, so his disciples saw something in Jesus that they knew a key to Jesus was prayer. If his disciples didn't think prayer was a key to Jesus, why would they say to him, teach us how to pray? Why would Jesus say, this is how you pray? They wanted to pray. Now, the only reason you want to do anything in your life is that you see there's an advantage or you, look, you think it's fun. So why do I want to ride a horse? Looks like fun to me. Now, if once I ride the horse and it's lots of fun, but then it comes to buying the horse and paying for the feet of the horse and shoveling the manure, I have to decide how much fun is in that horse because <laughs> there's a lot of shoveling that goes with fun. Okay, and so there's things that we desire to do, and then once we've done them, we say, done that, gone there, let's go, let's move on. Then there's other things that, that people go on. So these disciples saw Jesus. They, didn't, they saw that his strength came from something he did, and they called it prayer. So they said to him, teach us how to pray. And guess what? He said, I will. Here it is, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Uh, Matthew six thirty three. Seek, we went again, half review, half new. Seek his kingdom, 
We talked about that yesterday. Um, a little sidelight. Another place that tells us what is kingdom. So he said, how do I seek his kingdom? It's basically seek his will. Uh, in in the, the disciples' prayer, it says, I want your will in heaven on the earth. It says, our Father, which heaven, ha- our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. So he thinks we should have an awareness of what the kingdom is. And it's something in heaven. Thy kingdom come. It's something that's not here. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. So we, he, according to that prayer, he thinks God's will and God's kingdom are together. Amen. So God's will and God's kingdom. So that's together. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. So we already have our assignment now. When it says seek the kingdom, I know exactly what my kingdom job is. Is to ask, figure out what God wants on the earth that's already going on in heaven. We already have a few wonderful scriptures that he told us what he wants. He wants everybody saved. He told, tells us all these things. So you already know what the kingdom is. That's why he didn't have to tell you what the kingdom is. You already know what the kingdom is. And then it says his kingdom is not meat or drink, so it's nothing in the natural, but righteousness, peace, and joy. Where is it? In the Holy Ghost. So the kingdom of God and the Holy Ghost are the same. So don't focus on the righteousness. Don't focus on the peace. Don't focus on the joy. Focus on the Holy Ghost. Because in the Holy Ghost, there's righteousness, peace, and joy. And in the Holy Ghost is the kingdom of God. So you, we all know how to get the kingdom of God. We all know what to seek. We have to seek the Holy Ghost. If I seek the Holy Ghost, he's not contrary to the kingdom. I have to seek to walk in righteousness. Now, let's go back to Matthew six thirty three. So we said the key is not finding. Thank God we will find if you seek, but you'll never find all the kingdom of God. You'll never find all the kingdom of God in all the years you live on the earth. Moses didn't get it all. Uh, No great preacher got it all. Um, But you'll find more and more and more of the kingdom of God. So we work within what we have. But he says, so he didn't say you have to find it all, but he did say you have to seek it. And why do I say that? As I love, there's an illustration I do with Robert. I don't think... Many people I know would have the courage or the guts to do what Robert did. So Robert, for some reason, I don't know whether God did it or, or it was just sometimes people can't relax when they get filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't know. Usually, if we give them three words, usually within a week or month, they relax at home and they now get the whole language. Robert, I don't know now whether he has his full language, but I'm going to tell you for years, Robert had one word. I don't know what it was, kalaba, that's mine. You know, kalaba, shandalaba, shandala, kedeva, shandalaba. That's what, those are my tongues. So Robert had one word. Now see, if you went into your mind, you might say, well, he was saying the same things. But see, is God listening to your words or is God listening to your heart? He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks to God. Does God really need the languages of the angels so that God can understand what you're saying? Or does God need to interpret every prayer? Is God literally interpreting my prayers when I'm speaking in French or I'm speaking in Italian or I'm speaking in Swahili? Is he up in heaven? Shh, what's my, what, okay, we're turn, translating this back from this language into heavenly language. No, he's interpreting my heart. So when I turn my heart on and my mouth on praying in tongues, God is taking, why? Because the Holy Ghost is giving me the intent to pray. It's my praying that gives the authority to the Holy Ghost to move. That's what people don't understand. I'm only needed for my authority. I'm not needed to come up with the language. I'm not needed to come up with what God wants prayer about. That's God's job. He knows what he wants prayer about. Almost all the time you get it wrong. Most of the things you think you're praying about, most of them, you're getting them slightly wrong or greatly wrong. And that's what we said yesterday. He says, actually, will you quit praying about all those things? Pray about what I want. Seek my kingdom. I'll take care of all those things for you. But see, it seems very ungodly not to pray for, especially people with their kids. You're not supposed to be praying all the time for your kids. You're supposed to trust in the Lord for your kids. You're supposed to thank God for your kids. You're supposed to bless your God. Oh, God, please help them not to get an accident today. God, please help them not get an accident today. Please Do you not think God's trying to keep them out of every accident? Do you think God's in the accident business? Lord, bless my kids. 
Oh, thank you, God, for those great kids. Right now, they're going through an annoying season, and they're going to really learn a lot from this annoying scene, but I'm not going to get annoyed. Thank you, Lord, how you're moving on my kids. Thank you, Lord, that they're walking with you. Praise you, Lord, for giving me the beautiful kids. Thank you, Lord. See, it's when you get in there into meddling, and God's working on them just like he's working on you, and you begin to steal your prayer life because that's where you'll get discouraged, and everything you see is where you get discouraged. And then when you're going through struggles, you get discouraged because you're going through struggles, so you quit praying when God's asking you to take on big things. And so we get on the little, and we lose on the little rather than winning on the big and letting God help us with our thing. So it says, this is the other thing. He says, seek. Matter of fact, the first thing you have to keep seeking all your life as far as I'm concerned. And that's why I'm saying with Robert. So Robert's faith to me was so big because he could faithfully say his word over and over and over and over and over again. And he didn't let his mind steal from him because everybody else says, well, that sounds like I'm making it up. So they quit praying in tongues. Oh, that doesn't make sense to me. So they quit praying in tongues. So who made you the sense of the world? Who gave you super brain to figure out how God moves? See? And so most of the church, because they don't get it, says, I don't want it. And they lose the power of the Holy Ghost in that form of prayer. Thank God there's other forms of prayer. Okay, so they get their prayers answered. They just don't get the easy prayer, which is we talked about yesterday, Holy Ghost prayer. 